Okay, we are reconvening for our second round. Um, the title of this section is uh, Public Opinion and Dominant Discourses in Conflict Dynamics. Uh, our first uh, presenter has a pre-recorded presentation, somewhat like the Oscars when, you know, they have to be somewhere else. Uh, that'll be Sarah Cobb's uh, Narrative Intersections of Hate and Gender. Um, and then we will have Solon Simmons with narrative profiling, how to take the other suffering seriously, followed by Mark Shaney, historic discourses in conflict. And I will give, I think we're, we're doing, still doing 12 minutes, and I will give you five, two, and one minute countdown. So um, I guess we are now ready for Sarah's presentation. Concerned about the role of the left. Um, in producing violent narratives about the right and wanting to avoid basically delegitimizing practices that uh, foment conflict. I did a little analysis of the narrative on the left and found that it um, basically displays the characteristics of a violent narrative, externalizing a responsibility, constructing the other as evil, and um, blaming the set of conditions on uh, and being victim and blaming uh, the other as victimizer. So I wanted to learn more about these groups, uh, hate groups, and of course the the um, main resource for this is uh, mounted by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which hosts a hate map and has defined hate group as an organization based on its official statement or principles, um, the statements of leaders or its activists that has beliefs or practices that attack or malign an entire class of people on, for their immutable characteristic. Um, there's a growing concern that these groups are increasing and um, that they're um, uh, increasing their recruitment as well. Now, this is a snapshot of their website, which shows they have 954 groups that have been identified. But it's interesting, very interesting, the role they're playing um, socially. They have they circulate this report to 55,000 law enforcement agencies. So they are known in law enforcement as the, sort of the gold standard for understanding hate in the United States. And all these groups are on the radar of law enforcement teams. And of course, the people who are named as hate groups are um, extremely upset about this and, and experience it as itself an act of hate. Um, it's interesting to see that these hate groups themselves uh, generate what might be called a hateful harmonic in the sense that they are more than the sum of their given positions. They're, they're, they add up to something more than the sum of their parts um, in the sense that there is a resonance across them that builds to a, uh, to a fever pitch or to a, you know, they're, 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 more, they're more able to get traction in social media and elsewhere because of this uh, harmonic phenomena. Um, we decided to use Butler, um, picking up on Butler, to think about the body politic basically as a, as a place like the body where you could do analysis and intervention by studying the signifying practices that are present there and on the presumption that these are highly gendered. Um, we did research, we looked at the way in which, um, what do we know about women in hate groups? And we see that women uh, have been undervalued in hate groups. They're considered masculine spaces, but they're actually not. Uh, women recruitment is up. Um, women come in through the side door of these organizations and um, then pick up the ideology after they get in. And they often have a uh, conversion um, after they get in. They tell conversion stories about the the role of these groups in their lives and what it's meant to them. And here you see the WKKK um, back in 1920 or so. And you see a woman who was interviewed by Catherine Bleas say, it's not so much as I am in the Klan, it is the fact that the Klan is in me. And by the Klan being in me, I have no choice other than to remain. I can't walk away from myself. Um, this uh, then we looked at the discourse. Uh, basically, that really shows the integration of the group with the women's identity. Then you look at the discourse on uh, the research on discourse and narrative, and you see that there's some that focuses on speech, for instance, metaphors that are tied to the production of social identity and discriminatory practices. But basically, it's not dynamic, that research. Um, and it's basically missing attention to power. 
Then there's research on narrative positioning and the production of white identity. And again, it's more um, functional in nature and doesn't address power. Then you look at the, then there is research on uh, what's called games of truth and um, how subject positions are produced in discourse and narrative. And this research treats narratives critical to the performance of, you know, uh, borders and boundaries uh, around subject positions. And it examines the process of abjection itself and sees it as central to regulating production of both subject and agency, what it takes to be a human. And we picked up uh, this latter uh, chunk of research, um, and particularly three main authors. One, uh, Hilda Nelson, who's written about damaged identity. Della Roca, who builds on her work, um, helping us define uh, privilege from a narrative lens. And Winslade, who's looked at lines of force and lines of flight, the grid lines along which narratives cruise and um, what people do to escape them. Um, Della Roca, building on Nelson, notes that, um, uh, let's see, we've been interested in the way in which women are using these signifying practices to construct their sense of self and their the agency and the, the way they move around, how they navigate in these groups. and. Um, to do that, you have to pay attention to agency. And Della Roca looked at um, Nelson's work, which presumes that you, to have agency, you have to have to control your actions, but you have to have normative competency, which means other people have to see you as capable of making moral decisions. Uh, Della Roca went on to define um, when you don't, building on Nelson, noted that when you don't have, Nelson said, when you don't have moral agency, you have a damaged identity. And Della Roca went on to say that actually narrative inflation, which is the narrative equivalent of privilege, uh, it's another form of damaged identity. He says, uh, privileged identity could be one of which the dominant narratives are composed of elements that increase the opportunities of the individual that bear it. Instead of deprivation of opportunity, there could be an inflation. Here the stories that come out of the dominant narrative justify this inflation. And that creates, he says, a go-no-go -no -go zone by which people make the other abject and in the process restrict the space of the subject itself. So this privilege uh, of which narrative inflation actually doesn't necessarily increase the space of operations for the speaker, but actually in a sort of a irony, ironic way, uh, is is negatively impacted by the way in which they have excluded the other. The larger the objection, the larger the group that's excluded, the less space there is for self. So he says the uninhabitable, the abject zone, with the, the other, is the no-go zone for the dominant agent. And it's my argument here that the relative size of the no-go zone compared to the go zone that is accessible to the agent will determine the degree of freedom. So basically, the more you abject, the more you people you push out, the less space there is for, for one to operate, the, 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 and the deeper the lines of force, we would argue. So what we're going to do, what we did was um, look at the no go zone, no go, no go zones, um, and the nature of the exclusionary matrices that are used to create these. Then we looked at the differences between these exclusionary matrices that are performed by the women and then the and the gap that it might have in the group itself um, you know how these exclusionary matrices may be different then we looked at the contours of this narrative inflation as a way to make sense of you know how women are experiencing privilege um, and 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 enacting it um, in narratively um, and then the last thing we did was look at the sort of how they navigate these lines of force that are laid down by the group about what they're supposed to do and not do and, and how they navigate that. And we are very aware of our own privilege as white women. We have a Middle Eastern um, student person in our group, but we've talked about race and gender and our own privileges and um, are attending to the own our lines of force and exclusionary practices um, that we have ourselves are enacting in this process. 
Um, we've created a database. We've gone multiple rounds of IRB because we don't want to commit deception. And let me tell you, recruitment has been extremely difficult. Let me tell you about one woman. So we've got, when we wrote this paper, we only had one woman completed, basically representing the theoretical framework to you. Now we've got about a dozen interviews done and, um, and more set up. And this woman, she does lobbying. She's pro-life and anti-Muslim. Um, she's being challenged by uh, some, uh, one, two of her seven children, all of whom she's homeschooled, because they've got either Muslim boyfriends or they've got tattoos, things like that. And she's working across uh, political lines a as a lobbyist. Um, we looked at her no go, her go no go zones. What can she be, and what can she not be? And basically, she she cannot engage in conflict with others is, is not appropriate, it's not kind, it's against God's will. Um, so she must um, comport herself, navigate conflict in ways that doesn't escalate it. Um, she's always got to be kind and her faith is a, she's got to be faithful and that's a requirement for her life. So prayer is a, also a requirement. Um, legislative practices is a, is advanced based on facts. It's not about ideology. It's about these are the facts and let me share them with you and those facts, if I do my job right, will convince you. Um, and democracy is a place where, um, you know, all opinions are legitimate, but because she has a relationship to God through faith, um, her, her obligation is to bring forward the facts which would advance God's position, not just hers. Um, she's got an exclusionary matrix here, which is Muslims and what she calls keyboard activist people who are just, you know, ranting and raving online. Human traffickers, confused women that have abortions, and, and women who don't uh, spend time raising their children. Um, there's a big moral gap that she set, that she describes between herself and the group. Uh, the group has been having lots and lots of internal conflict, and she is not having it. Um, she's actually created a division of the group with a separate division of the group split off from the main group because she doesn't she wants to work differently and she struggles to balance work family things that so many women do um, she's she you can see the narrative inflation as central to her life um, she presumes she'll always be able to take care of her children she's always going to have resources to do that so she does that as a matter of choice um, and doesn't contemplate the that, that that discourse sets her up to see the issue of taking care of children as as a as an act of will or as a choice that one would make. Um, also, narrative inflation keeps her uh, is, in, is visible in the way in which she um, harnesses basically her own prayer to stay close to God and this proximity to God uh, gives her privilege. And we've looked at her um, infiltrated consciousness, that which is she sort of accepted about herself based on the grid line she's part of. And it's about being a mother and a wife and a Christian um, and that she'll always have the money and the support to um, be a good wife and mother and and because she also has a good father who's providing for the family. And finally, I would say that um, yet she has these lines of flight where she's multiplied her roles, basically, um, by being a lobbyist, esca escaping the gridlock or grid lines of motherhood. And she also escapes and disobeys um, the rules of the game by the grid lines of lines of force, by um, working with the other side on a regular basis, building relationships, making connections. Um, and this is because she's very, she describes very practical and not ideological. So this is just an interesting little glimpse into some of the complexities um, based on this first interview. We've got more, as I said, more coming and uh, a paper that offers a theoretical framework. Look forward to your feedback and thank you so much for listening. Okay. Our next presentation is Solon Simmons. Okay. okay. Uh, can am I on? Um, so wonderful to see everyone, and welcome to Point of View. I want to echo everyone else's comments about uh, Dennis Sandoli. I remember Dennis extremely well, and uh, I consider Dennis a friend of mine. 
uh, and I remember Dennis in his prime, which is hard to remember as it was at the end, but he's, he was an incredible figure, vigorous, intellectual, and exciting. And I must say, I like Karina's uh, suggestion to this, and I'm happy to participate in the first annual uh, Dennis Sindoli uh, research conference. So, so in anyway, I'm really happy to be here in that sense to remind myself of why I love this place. Um, I uh, also, Sarah opened with a very um, helpful, um, I'm, I'm intrigued by Sarah's research and always learn from her. And it made me want to read a quote from Hannah Arendt, which is not in my presentation, but I think it helps to characterize what I'm doing. And just so you know, I'm going to be speaking very quickly. This is a 50-minute presentation done in 12 minutes, so think of it as a, a kind of a preview for the movie, okay? So that's the way to manage it. So, uh, so where Hannah Arendt in Origins of Totalitarianism said, ideologies are harmless, uncritical, and arbitrary opinions only as long as they are not believed in seriously. Once their claim to total validity is taken literally, they become the nuclei of logical systems in which, as in the systems of paranoiacs, everything follows comprehensively and even compulsorily once the first premise is accepted. So that's important to me because that I've been on this quest, uh, and you can call me Ishmael, um, uh, for uh, figuring out what ideologies are and how to measure them and how to characterize them in a comprehensive way. That is not to speak about one ideology, not to speak about a couple of them, or even as Rich mentioned earlier, thinking about the, the class, um, uh, the uh, d discourse, if you will, in conversation with uh, those around identity, which are going to be critical. But thinking big picture, uh, I, I, I think I began this quest in 1996 when I was thinking about Ross Perot and the economic stories he was telling and why it was that the white working class seemed to be rising up uh, against his interests. And that was quite fascinating. And it's only gotten more interesting since then. Um, I won't run through all of these uh, features of, the, of what I'm calling root narrative theory. One of the biggest challenges has been settling on a, a nomenclature, if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think, you know, and, and so since I'm dealing with um, uh, uh, identity and narrative and values and ideology, all of those things being relevant and I think critical to the school, uh, nevertheless, I decided always storytelling in, in elections was what was interesting to me, storytelling in popular culture and political culture. And so what I'm calling this is the root narrative theory. And you'll see a bit why. I won't go through all of these things other than to say that I'm thinking about moral conflicts, which is an old uh, a, a concept by um, Pearson Littlejohn that is, uh, was uh, really interesting about incommensurability, thinking about different structures uh, of root narratives, uh, how they develop in response to, to countervail abuses of social power. So power is going to be critical to this, and how the narratives emerge as a reaction to power. Uh, and that that, that that social power is not free-floating, but it, it, it derives from institutional structures. So the sociologist in me is going to be critical in all this. Um, that they, these institutional structures, I say, they come in. You can characterize them in a thousand different ways. What I'm going to do is settle on four, the, the kind of Weberian ideal typical approach, to say there are four approaches here, four major forms, which I steal from the sociologist Michael Mann. But what's interesting about that is that it, and, and each one it is, it can be thought of as a means. So the means of, the, means of production be the classic, right? But Max Weber used the term the means of administration to talk about bureaucracy. So keep in mind that the idea of state power is anchored in what Weber already had called the means of administration. Then there are others that I'm going to say that emerge, what I'm going to call the means of defense and the means of socialization, because I think these point to two other large domains uh, that, that each produces its own uh, paradigm, if you will, of, uh, of, uh, that, that produces root narrative. The root narratives develop to countervail abuses of social power, and just as there are four forms of these stru institutional structure, that I'm going to say there are four forms of root uh, families of root narratives, not the root narratives themselves. And these can be easily remembered as the securitarian, the libertarian, the egalitarian, and the dignitarian. Okay, so that's a lot of the big. So if you walked away with that, you'd have a big sense of what he was talking about. Okay, so uh, and from this, and and I just just because I love these kind of acronyms, when you look for these narratives in any any discourse, you're going to find this is going to work anywhere. They're best performed when they're evil. That is emotional, vivid, intense, and literary. That is, if you look for evil in the narrative, you're going to find the stories. Okay, that's going to be one of the premises that the kinds of stories that stick are going to be emotional, they're not going to be rational, they're going to be, you're going to be able to see them, they're going to have an intensity, emotional intensity to them, and there's going to be a literary element, so symbolism, uh, figures of speech, and so on. That's the stuff you're going to be looking for to know that you've got what I'd call ideological or narrative content. In any narrative source, anywhere, uh, talking about politics. I'm not going to go through all this, but other than to say that the whole goal of this approach, um, maybe in 1996, I was thinking purely about political science and sociology, now it's about what do we do. So how do we engage in practice? And what I think the exciting thing about this is, is that it can produce tools, why I call it narrative, critical narrative profiling, because all you need is, is someone talking about what it is they care about in a conflict. You could use this tool, this approach, 
to characterize their moral standpoint and a mixture. It's going to be a blend, they're going to be intersections. And therefore, you, could, you have a kind of a tool which would allow you to engage that person where, at, the, at their pain, as I sometimes say, where they're suffering. Now, I won't go through all these. Here's a, here's a quote from Thomas Hobbes. Another way to think about what I, this theory, the shorthand is, it's the Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Karl Marx, and Franz Fanon theory, okay? That is, each one of those, they go through that again. Thomas Hobbes, right, focusing on predation and security. Legal, uh, John Locke on legal coercion, so it's about the abuse of power embedded in the law itself, okay, and the sanctioning power of the law itself, and the corresponding value of liberty which emerges in response to that. Karl Marx, who's a, a, one of our other great theorists, uh, as we said, is his birthday is now, uh, focusing um, on exploitation, and, and equality. But I want to say, some of the vulgar forms might be the most interesting in Marxism. So if you're in, into Marxism and you know critical theory, some of the, the, some of the, the, uh, some of the, the, the more, the, the sort of practical forms of Karl Marx uh, theory thought is interesting. And Franz Fanon, focusing, I, I think, most on what is interesting to us, the notion of colonization, on status, on humiliation, on domination. But domination not thought of merely as bureaucratic, but as a cultural domination and the concept of dignity. Um, looks like we're going to lose this presentation soon. Um, just, uh, low battery. Um, s and it's not mine, so it's not my fault. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, the, so, the interesting thing, so here's one way to, the, the, the overall theoretical framework is deep structure. Um, and so this goes, it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, I borrow this concept from um, Gerdes Grimas, who's a, a great uh, structural uh, thinker um, in, in, in the literary area. But what I'm going to say is that each one of these, you can think of each of these as, so we've got our Hobbes worried about intercommunal violence. We've got our Locke worried about legal coercion as a kind of paradigmatic abuse. You've got Marx thinking about economic exploitation. And you've got Fanon, who's the, the sort of virtuoso theorist, thanks to Kevin Averick for giving me this language of intergroup domination. But what happens is each one of these things has its own paradigm, intersects with all the others. So the meaning is derived from how they work against one another through the conversation and dialogue of these great paradigmatic approaches. Okay? So what happens is this complex theory, which you're just going to be like, huh, that's interesting. That's where it comes from. Okay? Because I'm going to zip through that very quickly just so you get a sense of how this works. So here's a great the theory of history that emerges. Um, you've got uh, military power, legal power, economic and status power, the same kind of constructions. You've got the, the great theorists, each representing a various value system. And then you've got the, the West, you've got the whole history of Western civilization, at least, Westphalian state formation, Atlantic Revolution, socialist revolutions and decolonization. And outside, you've got a set of root narratives, okay? Those blue on the outside, they, they, go, they correspond to Shalom Schwartz's value system. So what I like about this is it's an institutionally based value system. So it's not like uh, Jonathan Haidt's Moral Emotions. It's uh, based on, a, on, on our, our almost sociobiology. It's not even Lakoff's function of the brain, although I love Lakoff's work, but I never found it fully satisfying. And it's not Shalom Schwartz's idea of personal values. But instead, it emerges from this deep, uh, I think, deep <laughs> institutional analysis. At least it's been deep for me. Um, the, the structure of how you generate these things, and I'm going to really whiz through this, is what I'll call Grimace's semiotic square. If you don't know what it is, you can find it on uh, various sources online. But what's interesting is this, is that you take two things and contrast them, and through their contrast, you get the meaning. So take the words peace and violence, okay? They're, they're contrary, they're different. Um, in, the, in the bottom section, the, the, the non-peace is the opposite of peace. The non-violence is the opposite of violence. Non-violence tends to imply peace, but it's different from peace. Non-peace is different from violence, but it tends to imply peace, I mean uh, violence. So that is, you get a whole structure of meaning, if you will, a kind of a, a, a signifying structure through this thing. And you can do this again and again. This is where you're going to say, huh, and, and, and wonder about it. OK, so then what we have is we've got defense and liberation. We've got two kinds of things, predatory Hobbesian approach versus the Fanon domination approach. Two root narratives emerge from it, what I'll call liberation and defense. Um, again, you can do this again and again. What you find is you've got um, the contrast of security and liberty produces unity and consent. That between liberty and equalities, property and reciprocity, that between recognition and loyalty, uh, that, that, that uh, Marx and Fanon recognition and loyalty, and then there's, and there's two more. So but the point is, is there are six of these things, just to go back here for a second, there's six of them, they merge out of these four basic paradigms, right? I told you you weren't going to be able to get the whole thing. The, but four of these big paradigms, through their intersection, the meaning emerges, it's all about the violation of social power and how ideologies are grounded in it. Well, why would you care about going through all that? Well, what it does is it gives you a very simple profiling technique. What it means is that you can go through and take every sentence in a document, and you can say, is this person working within the, the space, remember Hannah Arendt, of defense? 
or of unity or of humanity and so on. Each one of these things, oh, two minutes, is, is a way to characterize the, the, let's say, the kind of point they're making. The ideological, let's put it in very simple terms, the ideology they're using in that sentence, okay? So what you have at the end of the day is a document which is characterized by 60% of this kind of thing, 30% of that, 20% of this, and so on. So that is, you've got a profile of the kinds of moral language, the moral grammar that they're using in each one of the documents. So what can you do with it? Well, I did it to, I, I use this, I'm, I'm uh, looking at the Nobel Peace Prize. So I went and I characterized all of the, the speeches given by the winners of the Nobel Peace Prize, and then, I, and then I, I sorted them into these narrative profiles. And then I went through a K-means clustering exercise. I tried other clustering, but just to generate a set of types, just to say, well, what are the different kinds of peacemakers? How would you characterize these things? Well, it turns out the biggest type is what I call a unifier, next to what I call the libertarian, next to the dignitarian, then a defender, a humanitarian, egalitarian, and then the Muhammad Yunus is his own kind of guy, and uh, Leigh McBowley is also uh, her own kind of, uh, of peacemaker. Well, what is the name? Again, just the basic idea. These are the six different kinds I've got. What you see is that they're very different kinds of profiles, that they rely on different aspects of, the, uh, of, the, of, of these, these moral grammars, if you will. So the unifier tends to rely on unity. The libertarian tends to rely on, 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 on concerns with the lock and concerns of government and so on. So let me here just, I'll quickly go through these examples. Here's Linus Pauling, who won in 62. What's he talking, he emphasizes unity and a little bit of humanity, but he's, he's focused on this concept of, of can't we all get along? Can't we all get over our partisanship? The libertarian is a quite different orientation. 1977, we see Amnesty International wins, and it's all based on consent. That is, the government is the aggressor. The government is the villain. The government is what you need to be worried about, and we need to, con and we need to confront that, which matters because when you talk to this person, which is the idea of narrative profiling, that you should not lead with unity if you're talking to Amnesty International, okay? You should talk about the abuse of power of governments, period, and don't, don't, don't do much else. Yeah. That's an important thing. Uh, the dignitarian, and this is a lot, of, a lot of us are going to be dealing with these kind of identity conflicts, what I call liberation and inclusion are the two main characteristics of Desmond Tutu's speech, okay? And then unity, okay? Unity is important for all of them, but you have to recognize that if you're going to talk to Desmond Tutu, you probably want to be attentive to this. Now, it's just a sample of one important speech, but you probably want to be attentive to that, and, or any of the people you're dealing with uh, as well. Uh, Jimmy Carter, we think of him as the great uh, uni uniter, but what it turns out is that he's the guy who talks about defense, the, the danger of the violent other, those people who want to kill us, more than anybody else in the entire sample, more than Obama, more than Theodore Roosevelt. It's Jimmy Carter who's talking about making sure the bad guys don't kill us. Now, he does it in a nuanced way. He's a very progressive kind of guy, but he, does it, he focuses on unity, but anyway. So uh, another one is the humanitarian, which, yes, you might imagine, is concerned with humanity. Lech Valesa, now this is what's interesting, is that only three of them, I think, if I'm right, come up with any focus on what I call reciprocity, which is the class narrative. Okay? People don't talk about equality. It's not structural violence in that sense is not part of peace, and that's quite interesting. Okay? Now, so uh, let, me, let me finish off here. So I'm still in quest of this thing, and I can't decide if I'm Ahab or Ishmael, but I'm one of those two, uh, and, and, and something's going to turn out. I hope I survive. But, the, but I, I, the, the key issue is that if you want to understand where, the, where, the, where, you're, where those you are dealing with, um, where their pain is, you've got to recognize the root narratives. You've got to be able to, and you do this already, and it's called hitting the right notes in a conversation. Because if you lead in the wrong way, you don't get it done. And the most important thing of all is that policy and values are, are, are logically separable. Any kind, of, any kind of policy can be associated with any one of these root narratives. So just to be focusing on a root narrative is not to say you're ignoring the policy. The policy can be associated and reframed and repositioned in any one of these 12. I talked about 12. So the, the idea that you're ignoring the person probably says more, has more to do with the narrative that you're using, the moral grammar you're using, than the actual policy, the actual technical argument you're making. And that's the most critical point of the theory. So more to, be, more to, more to come later. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, Mark, the floor is yours. And before I start, so I know how I'm advancing this, you learned this? I use the arrows. Use the arrow? Yeah, the side. Okay, I can use the arrows. So um, I'm going to switch uh, the focus here a little bit and to get, um, in many ways, a hyperlocal focus set against a backdrop of. Uh, contemporary tensions and issues. Um, so in contrast to the, the theoretical and the generalizing perspectives, 
Um, my interest, uh, starting about two years ago, was looking at how are local communities engaging what in many respects is a reactivation of interest in Confederate commemoration, and how histories, uh, how uh, communities, local communities, are grappling with uh, local histories, especially a legacy of racial, racial violence and um, what the Confederacy means in uh, history. So I'm going to walk through. This is at the very beginning of a research study. And the research study, the focus is a case study. But the methodology is oral history and grounded theory. So um, at the very beginning of data collection and assembling the documents and the narratives out of which an understanding of how communities are um, encountering and resisting and actively engaging some of these controversies. So the case at the heart currently of, of my effort is the Jeb Stewart High School slash Justice High School renaming conflict. It's a local high school located in Falls Church, part of Fairfax County. Um, so it is an accessible case. Part of that becomes important because this is also a student learning project. So one of the methods for data collection is through an advanced practice class for the undergraduates uh, in our program uh, who are part of the Arlington Fellows Peace Building Fellows Program. And so this is using research and practice-based, practice-linked research as a component um, of their learning. And so the, this project has a whole bunch of different goals because the audience is also intended to be uh, conflict practitioners who are engaging at a local community level in deliberative processes around some of these commemorative uh, conflicts. So just to remind you of uh, events that you're probably aware of and also to uh, re-illustrate some of the events that are being referenced in many of the local communities that are engaging in debates about what to do with Confederate monuments and memorials Confederate flags, as well as the names of schools. There are two events that bracket many of the local community efforts, and they represent both a spike in organizing and acceleration, a precipitation in organizing, as well as a reference point and a motivation uh, for organizing. They are not the only things that are referenced, but these are two that are emerging out of looking at multiple case studies um, that are important. So the two events are both that bracket uh, much of this are both Charleston, South Carolina, as well as Charlottesville. So I'm going to, th there's no text on these slides, so I'm going to scroll through them relatively quickly just to remind you what it is that people are referencing um, in their organizing efforts. So in 2015, in June, uh, Dylan Roof killed nine church members of the uh, African Episcopal Meth Emanuel African Episcopal Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina. One of the things that was discovered upon investigation relatively quickly, and these circulated online very rapidly, were both white supremacist writings as well as pictures of him with guns and Confederate flags. And this rapidly focused some of the conversations around this. Another piece that was reported, especially locally, and became highly relevant, was that one of those who died was the Reverend Clemente Pinckney. He was also a state senator, former state representative. He uh, laid in state at the state capitol. And one of the photos that circulated, especially locally, regionally, and then in activist networks, was of his coffin passing the Confederate flag that then was located on the grounds of the uh, State House. The flag has a long history of organizing, so this represented another punctuation point um, in the activism around the appropriateness, the location of the flag. It had been on top of the State Capitol since 1961, originally raised uh, at the anniversary of and commemoration ceremonies around the Confederacy. Um, it was taken down uh, after, this isn't when it was taken down, um, but in response to renewed organizing and the, the re, reassessment of the meaning of the flag shifted in a way that it hadn't happened before. So Nikki Haley, shortly after uh, Bree Newsom had done a direct action and removed the flag in cooperation with other activists, 
Two days later, Nikki Haley called for the removal of the flag, and on July 8th, the legislature actually voted for the removal of the flag, and it's now an exhibit within the local Confederate relic room and military history museum in Charleston. So a long history of activism against, the, against and around and about the flag um, resulting in its eventual removal. That same event sees the spike in many local community efforts to, um, to challenge, to move, to grapple with um, Confederate symbols uh, within the community. There's a two-year period where many, many school districts, many, many communities are looking at a variety of um, monuments and, and other kinds of efforts. Excuse me. Then this summer, this was originally uh, one of my case studies, but things got very complicated very quickly uh, in Charlottesville. Charlottesville had engaged in a process to um, examine, relocate, reinterpret, remove um, with a, with a uh, commission that had been established to decide what do we do with two statues in particular, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. This is Robert E. Lee in two parks downtown. The decision had been made. Um, recommendations were varied from the commission. The decision had been made to remove the statues. The ensuing, um, uh, following that, Charlottesville became a locus of uh, attention uh, in many respects. Between May and August, there were four separate events that were um, the focus of Depending on one how characterizes movements, and I'm sensitive from Sarah's presentation of how do we talk about the current, uh, the current climate? How do we talk about what's happening um, when we see these um, activated uh, protests? Um, there was both, um, I don't have a picture of the first one, but beginning in June, there were, um, there were gatherings. KKK organized in Charlottesville at the Stonewall Jackson statue in July. And perhaps more well known uh, was the organizing for the so-called Unite the Right rally, uh, which brought many um, of the groups that are tracked by Southern Poverty Law Center, as Sarah referenced, and variously described as white nationalist, white ident identitarian, white supremacist, um, uh, a whole a, a whole range. One of the features that was very notable was the extent to which the Confederacy iconography was a component of the organizing of the day itself and of a, a merging of narratives um, in many respects. And the statues became there and in many other places a locus of organizing um, and, and part of the narratives. So on August 11th, there was a torchlit rally through the grounds of the University of Virginia. And on August 12th was the uh, actual rally itself, which if, as analysts, if we look at the varieties of uh, tension and violence that that represented, um, from a high uh, militia presence to a lot of symbolism, the convergence of many groups, and the eventual um, uh, street level violence um, that this uh, emerged into, as well as the eventual death of Heather Hare, one of the, or one of the activists who had been part of um, the events. Those images are in part what fueled and what we can see in local communities who are talking then about what do we do? What is our local response? So one of the things that, that happens bracketed by these two events is a conversation about what do these represent, a reactivation of local groups who are organizing to remove, shift, change, reinterpret uh, names, monuments, and memorials. What the study that I'm doing that I, that I think is important is to bring this down to what, do we, what happens at the local community level? What do these events look like when we see the intersection between activism and organizing and deliberative processes? Most of the memorials and certainly school names are covered to various degrees uh, by legislative rules and, uh, and guidelines. So how these progress locally is highly variable. 
and the history that they reference is also different. Not all of the statues are Robert E. Lee. Not all the schools are named after what we would consider uh, dominant Confederate symbols. Many of them reflect a deeply local history. And so understanding the material, the narratives that local communities are using to make sense of their relationship to what is the, the, the churn and the, the larger uh, conversation here uh, is important, in particular because the efforts to address or have a conversation are often very binary. The deliberative processes that I have been looking at so far are often organized um, as a competitive process with a very stark narrative. Um, in the Jeb Stuart case, keep or change the name. Um, and the processes of understanding or exploring when the narratives do not overlap. Most of these cases, there is no sense of on, uh, let's see, on one side we have a lost cause narrative which values the Confederacy and what we're talking about is the preservation of history and often heritage. And on the other side is a conversation about a legacy of racial uh, violence. Um, Imram Kendi at, the, at American University calls the monuments an unloaded gun. They cannot kill you, but the threat is obvious. Those narratives in most of these communities have little to no overlap. In some they do, and in some we see a shift and a um, interpenetration of the two narratives. And that's what uh, the case study is about, is an opportunity to look at how people are living uh, the conflict and the strategies and efforts um, and lives that are involved in looking for community responses. Did I make it? One minute? Okay. <laughs> it's time now to hear from our discussants. Um, we have Lauren Kinney and Elena, can you please teach me how to say your last name? <laughs> Sirmizi, I think, is something I can, I can do with more dignity for you. <laughs> um, whoever would like to go first, um, please go ahead and jump on in. So we're just splitting our time equally. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to echo the sentiments that have already been expressed um, today about Dr. Sandoli. Um, on a personal note, when I was working on my master's, I had my own health issues that at one point I thought were going to prevent me from even finishing my degree. And he was a central source of support for me. Um, and in fact, was the person that planted the seed of even considering to go back and do my PhD. So I can say that he's single-handedly the reason why I even thought about going down this route. And so I think that um, not only has he left an imprint on our community you know, for his research and scholarship, but also, as it was mentioned earlier, because of his kindness and compassion. So um, he will definitely be missed. Um, so uh, regarding the, the panelists, um, I thought that all three presentations gave a really interesting take on the role of discourse in shaping conflict dynamics. Um, discourse is not just reflecting, it doesn't just reflect reality, it shapes reality, it's a form of meaning making. And so um, it seems like all of the panel members have demonstrated different approaches for analyzing discourse in ways that attend to power dynamics and uh, that approach conflict as a fluid process versus a static entity. And so um, they've also demonstrated different processes for identifying discursive patterns and for developing nuanced typologies that enhance our ability to understand how discourse functions in conflict. Um, drawing from the presentations, it seems to me that there are two central issues that are very important to consider in any form of discourse analysis. Um, attending to agency and also legitimacy. So discourse often can function to convey agency or to strip someone of agency. It can serve to legitimize the self and delegitimize the other. And in uh, Dr. Cobb's work, you saw how she had developed the exclusion matrices and, and that typology uh, based on 
the role of exclusion in discourse and what it functions to do in conflict. And then with Dr. Simmons, you saw um, he looked predominantly at morality and values. He talked about moral grammar and uh, went over his profiling technique, which also I think speaks to issues of legitimacy in conflict and how people fuel or, or justify their actions in conflict. Um, and then with Dr. Shaney, what I think was a very also interesting take is she looked at Confederate statues as symbols, and that I think is a very interesting way of demonstrating the intersection of rhetoric and action in conflict. Um, and so I, I just wanted to pose a question to all of you. Um, considering the structural com constraints that are imposed on our ability to create discursive shifts as conflict resolution practitioners, what do you see as the key structural constraints that limit the discursive parameters of the conflicts that your work is focused on? And, and structural can be used loosely. Um, that can be you know, institutional, uh, social norms, whatever, however you choose to define that. Answer first. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, um, so first of all, I would like to thank you for wonderful presentations. They were great and very interesting uh, research. Um, I think it l outlined how complex the narrative question is. That it's complex not only on a grassroots level or on a storytelling level, but it's also on a theoretical level um, that uh, Salon outlined. Uh, so um, I think what is interesting about the, all of these works is how um, uh, highlight, uh, it, it has been highlighted that uh, how the narratives emerge as a reaction to power, to personal experiences, and to the entrenched levels of the uh, society that are in, um, in the society, exist in the society. Um, I think, um, although we talked primarily uh, about the U.S. issues here, it's also um, important to point out that all of this work is transferable to uh, in on, an on the international level. Um, questions about the memory history and the memory uh, is important in every country. And um, what Mara is doing in regards to the um, um, memorials, to the Confederate memorials are transferable very easily to the um, my country of Moldova for example, or what uh, Sarah was doing uh, with the interviews um, of the far-right um, uh, members. Um, also is extremely important when we are talking about the uh, conflicts um, all over the world, I think. Um, and in this regards, I have a question about also how can you um, see your research or the results of your research to be uh, translated into um, change um, in uh, some kind of innovative ways. How we can translate all of this research into uh, tools or that would reach the younger population, that would reach a new incoming generation that uh, will be engaged in conflict in a um, year or two or in five years, what we can do to complicate the narratives uh, or to um, show the younger generation how to see the evil in narrative, uh, how someone put it, uh, but uh, to be able to determine that this is just a story or this is not just a story. Thank you. Well, let me let me start with Lauren since we began there. So the 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 sort of fire hose of this perspective that I threw out there, what I call the circle of power, because it's about I think we're all thinking about power and we're thinking about its limits. So each one of these four domains for me is a structural constraint. I think what's different about the current moment now that we're living through is that th this is why I represent it as a, as a circle is that we've closed the loop in a way, and, I, and it's not meant to be a simple stage theory, and it's not meant to be a, 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 an approach which is uh, which is in any way um, cl cleanly demarcates things off from one another. But I don't think there's any one of these structural constraints that predominates right now. I don't think that, for example, the, the issues of systemic humiliation are less in, or more important than the issues of economic inequality. I also don't think that the issues of government power and its abuse 
are any less important either. I think we see plenty of issue, um, examples of democracy in crisis. And I think probably in five years, we'll be thinking a lot about that, maybe next year. <laughs> you know, that is, how do we prevent democracies from dying, as has recently been written in a book. But also, I think that the security issue is dominating. So what I would say that the main challenge that we're facing structurally comes from different, or is different in different parts of the population. So for, for the, and, and there's a discursive issue here. So on the left, the, the main challenge is going to be if, if, if um, things like democracy are becoming critical and economic inequality are becoming critical issues to address with in policy terms, they're going to come up against the narrative framework that we all have. And I think, you know, Mara's example was perfect. I mean, you talk about the evil stuff, you know, the vividness, that the story that's so powerful, you can see the issue of humiliation and how central it is. And it's not to say that it's in any way not, but, in, but it's going to be hard for the left to become concerned about security issues in a serious way. It's going to be hard for the left to become concerned about um, the questions about democracy and classical liberalism that the right is going to start to occupy. And it's also, and it's been demonstrated demonstrably hard for the left to be concerned about uh, economic inequality. I mean, it's, it's amazing to be living through this period of time and, and yet still with there not much being done. But on the right, it's going to, there's a similar challenge because the right is so immersed in its classical liberalism and it's concerned about the government's power that that's, that structure is going to drive out its ability to see these actual challenges coming up. And for me, the question becomes, and this is a little bit to Elena's question too, is when you want to address these audiences and you want to deal with a radical disagreement, you know, how, do you, how do you speak in a way that both sides can hear, especially when it's public, right? And now everything is public. This is being streamed. I mean, everything is public. There's no lo local community anymore. To have those conversations which allow for the opening of space that Sarah talks about, I'm really intrigued by what she's doing here, that allow for agency. Because there's, even from the position of privilege, there's an inflation which narrows your moral scope. And it, it makes it very difficult to see. So I think the structural barriers for all of us are going to, it's going to be the security nerve is going to drive things out. Because there's going to be a lot of security concern. And that dominates. The, it, whenever you see it, this fear of violent death tends to drive all these things out, especially of the collective against the other. But each, the left and the right, ha, has its challenge. Um, and then just to the issue of um, how can your work be useful, I think for, for me that's been the biggest challenge in these, what, now 11 years or so that I've been here, is thinking, okay, well, how do I take all of my interest in research in a very abstract sense, but translate it into something meaningful? But that was always the, what was interesting to me. That's why I try to generate, the, so we have conflict maps, that's why I thought a profile would be interesting to say, who am I talking to? What do they, what, how do they reason? What sort of justifications do they tend to use? And, and what I love about what I, this approach from what's been intriguing to me is you don't have to have some sort of depth encounter with them. You just have to look at, the, at, a, at a way in which they justify their opinions to an audience they respect or care about. And from that, you can reconstruct the moral grammar they tend to use. It doesn't mean that the sample is good. It doesn't mean that it's meaningful. They're not sort of playing with you or, or being duplicitous. But I think that this is at least a way, what I'm hoping it could be, in addition to the kind of conflict mapping techniques that we have, that we could have some way of characterizing ideologies that weren't policy-based. Because so much of the political science literature is policy-based. Some of these great, Budge Robertson and Hurl had this wonderful approach, but it's all based on what policies you're approaching. And so then we've, we've opened the field for the psychologists and the cognitive scientists to dominate the emotional landscape of this. And I think that's in a way helpful and in a way distracting. Um, the, the, and, and I think that, that that kind of structural analysis could be very interesting to activists as well. And I may take your question in a slightly different direction as far as reading what, um, what, what's meant by structural uh, constraints and limits on discursive parameters. Um, but I think it also addresses the how do we translate this into um, something that we can use. That for me, one of the challenges has been where is the opportunity to do work with people around some of these issues? And that there are real challenges for having uh, platforms and access, as well as an audience, um, to examine some of these issues. And much of this isn't, can't be and isn't, uh, thinking back to Arthur's uh, presentation, it can't be short term. Um, that the relationships that are built within a community to actually engage in a re-examination of assumptions and the ability to hear um, the, the quite different uh, narrative, the quite different worlds within that people are occupying, um, and understandings and motivations that are happening, that I think, um, which is part of what draws me to the community deliberative efforts. Um, a school-based conflict draws in a very different audience than a, a more distant or um, I might even say academic understanding of 
what are some of these battles being fought over a school, uh, especially a public school-based co community, brings in a level of, um, it touches people, um, people who would not otherwise become involved in the conversations, which complicates the process, but also represents an opportunity, because it's a place where who we are as a community is being both represented and contested at the same time. And it's an engagement with community values and community articulation of um, an understanding of history, but also moving forward. And so there's a constant moving forward and back. And so I think that constraint of being able to find the places where um, the, the debates and the concerns and the ideas are instantiated. And I think the symbology of monuments and of school names has been a place to um, instantiate. It both shows and sharpens the, the differences in the debate and the discourses, but it also um, has potential to open them up. I think this is a good time to go and talk to the audience. Karina. It, OK. Do we have a microphone ringer? Wow, what a section. I really love it. So it's like really 3D for me. Uh, because of you show us this four domains of <laughs> perception and Mara really show how historic narratives and historic symbols are used to justify particular practices and particular positions of power. So my question for you, this 3D type of question, how we can use these historic narratives to create regimes of truth to colonize spaces within these four domains? Um, well, I think we're, this is an interesting thing to think about over the long time. I, my sense is that historical narrative is the currency of these kinds of these conversations. And so I think the critical piece for me, it depends on, if, if you're engaging in a conflict process, I think it's, it'd be helpful to get the parties to recognize the narrative um, that the other is going to take. I think that's one of the reasons in the problem solving workshops and the thing of Chris here, where you get, have people just yell at each other the first day, you know? Yeah. That is, so that those things get kind of aired and so that the, you have the, the framework of that so that, you know, the narratives are, 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 are laid on the table and so that when you start to encounter, before you can sort of peel them open and think about what the actual issues you're addressing are, uh, you 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 allow the narratives to dominate, and then you and then the setting makes it possible for people to to recognize the narrative without being wounded by hearing. So the important thing about the narrative is that when someone tells a story about the same objective facts from the dignitarian versus the libertarian point of view, both sides are deeply wounded. You know, and and they're using different history and they're different stories, but even all their language comes pre-coded and is and is a, is a gun pointed at the other. You know, and that and and that's an that's really interesting to me. So I think that. There's so much to be said, but I, my answer would be that that is the very currency of the research itself or the practice, was to, is to engage in historical narratives. And, and, and punctuation, when you begin the narrative and when you end it, and all those things are the critical features of history. And so I agree with Rich that, there's, that the historical element is really an important part of what we ought to be doing. I, I think that the, the regime, the idea of a regime of truth is intriguing and, and challenging um, at the moment. I, I think one of the things that I've seen so far is how difficult it is for deliberative processes to be constructed in a way that um, allow examination and that um, ability to have the narrative, but then also be able to engage with it and challenge it. And I think about um, dialogue processes, especially Bohmian processes that talk about a suspension of and the ability to walk around what um, people are bringing to um, a process. And that is largely absent in um, deliberative processes, especially if they're not actually deliberative, if they are majority vote based um, or are uh, reinforcing in many ways of the status quo or the loudest voices or the strongest effort. Um, so I think creating that space to re-examine and perhaps find a multiplicity of truths and then to commit to something that uh, fully recognizes a desired future. Um, so I, I think there's some challenges in construction of these processes. There are also huge constraints to resources and funding and knowledge and timing um, and an ability to engage with these. And so I think 
Um, but, but that getting that in and so that um, people can learn through a process has been one of the real challenges I see. Rich and deep uh, set of uh, presentations among all three. Um, so, and there's no way I can understand all of everything happened. Of my listening isn't as fast as you're speaking. Um, but uh, there was, uh, I, I really um, just applaud your elevation of a framing of a category of conflicts as the moral conflicts. We have intractable, we have all these different categories that we privilege. And within that framing, um, I just want to ask, kind of, or offer an observation and a question. You had uh, categories of injustice. You had different forms of injustice, which I think are so riveting. Um, and some people, some philosophers and philosophical thinkers say that in these conflicts, the groups define themselves so strongly in their conception of the injustice with a very weak, shallow, uh, sense of justice. So it's a form of irrationality or irrationality. Um, and so my question, are those forms of injustice your evil? Yeah. Well. So evil again for, the, uh, I wrote this down, emotion, vivid, integral, yes. intent, and liter literal. Literary. Literary, excuse me. Well, so the, the, just to, there's a lot to this philosophically, and, I, and I'm, I've been learning from my colleague um, for many years now and continue to do so. One of the things that I would say is that this perspective is based not on a summum bonum, but a summum malum interpretation of, of, of a philo moral philosophy. That it seems to me that the conflict narratives that are most likely to produce these intractable conflicts, these moral conflicts, have this conception of evil, but then the corresponding form of good becomes probably as caricatured too. What I, what's critical for me is the way in which the policy aspect of the technical aspect of the conversation is separable, not separate, but separable from the valued, values aspect. And so the, the, the conception of the good falls to the virtuoso theorists, of which there are thousands. So my, so my bookshelf, I have one bookshelf at home which just takes great theories, and whenever you mention stuff, I'm like, where does that fit? And I put them in one of my categories. And these become ways in which people, I think, imagine the positive future, but always within a space constructed by the conception of the summum malum. That, and that's what, for me, what's, what's interesting about Hobbes, that, that he's the first who articulates a philosophy in that way. And I think that's the beginning of a kind of a, of a science of institutional abuse of power. So I think there's a, there's the, the positive view is, um, is, a, is a, the aspect of the technical work. Uh, but the problem of the technical work is that no one listens to your facts and your technical arguments unless they can hear your narrative. Uh, and, and, and so I, I don't, there's no way to answer your question right in a brief span, but it's, these are some of the reflections I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Solon, I appreciate your paper as well as the rest of the papers. I want to say that the structural imagination seems to me to be a tool for, say, conflict analysis. Uh, and then it would be something that will empower such an analyst to be able to view um, conflict situations and maybe rhetorics from like a bird eye. So how would you say that Sarah Cobb's work could relate with these structural imaginations? Also, Mara's too, because I just full disclosure, I live in the district she's studying, so um, my children will go to um, Justice High School, but not Justice Thurgood Marshall High School, because we didn't win that, that fight. Um, but uh, I think, well, my sense of this is that nobody gets outside the narrative. That's my kind of approach to these things, that no matter how technical you are, and I include uh, John Mearsheimer is one of my favorites, because he's this securitarian thinker, and Benga's in my class, we read these things. So, but, but even these people who say, oh, I don't do morality, I just do, I just do science, I just do facts, I just do technical. You, you scratch it a little bit and everything they're doing, all those technical arguments, in fact, presuppose a normative ar uh, infrastructure. They're, they're situated in a context. So what is it that John Mearsheimer is concerned about? Violent death. 
Okay, there's a very good, there's a, there's a good that he presupposes, which is you don't want to be killed by somebody else or dominated and destroyed by them. And that's just given in the Mirsheim. And he, he admits as much. And he, he has a prescriptive theory, too. This is what you should do, given that you're afraid of violent death. This is the best way to have the Korean War today, because China is going to be more powerful in 30 years, and you better do it now. Get it over with, right? So that's the Mearsheimer offensive realism. But it's not just descriptive. It's a normative argument, and it, and it presupposes um, a worldview. Um, so I think it translates down directly. I think that there's a scale and variance to any of this. I think you can take a, a conflict watching, you know, your, the, it was a great presentation, by the way. I saw, those images are so riveting. And what they do is they tell a story. And I immediately saw things that I, and I felt things. And I, and I started thinking in certain ways. And Sarah's, I think, is getting inside what Sarah's need about. So here's what's different between the, the work that Sarah and I do, I think. Hers is more syntagmatic analysis and mine's more paradigmatic, to put it in structural terms. That is, she's interested in sequences of how people tell stories within a particular context. She's not here to defend herself, but this is something I sometimes think. Lauren helped me to see this. That is, looking at, you know, from a propian point of view, you look at how these things build within a context. I don't actually care how they're sequenced at all. I mean, I do, but I don't really. That's not what I study. I'm just interested in the relative mix of these things, you know? That is, I just want to say, okay, uh, uh, um, uh, Amnesty International, what do I need to know about Amnesty International? By the way, if you talk, if you've done this, you see, start talking peace and get shut down. You know, don't talk unity, talk about, you know. And so, so I think in that case is that I could imagine a conversation where I was having, if, if someone from, from Amnesty is here, then I'm going to start talking about the danger of the, of the government and, and how governments are abusive and how autocratic systems. And I'm just going to pepper that in there because I know that that's what people need to hear so they can hear what I'm saying. You know, so I think it's a scale invariant in that way that you can apply it to. The, my goal, this is the, why it's the, this, is the, this is the Moby Dick of it, is that you could take any conflict discourse anywhere in the world, any point in history, and you could analyze it this way. That's my goal. And that's why it's such a challenge for me to deal with it. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to the local that, that Mara brought us and, and with all these uh, riveting photos. Um, and, and you speak about the local responses um, and reactivation of local groups. And I guess I want to ask you, you know, it, what kind of comes to mind for me is Mara Dugan's nested model and that there's this very local conflict going on in this broader social conflict, national conflict, et cetera. Um, so what is special about this very local response? What's unique when people claim it as my community, my school, my history, my heritage? Like, is there something that comes out that's different than this national, I'm part of a big thing? This is like, that. yeah, what's, local, what's special about the local part? I think in a very pragmatic sense, what's special about the local part is that's where things are happening. Um, that's where people are grappling with and living with and working out what um, their community is going to do. Uh, very few of these local conflicts have a, have a federal opportunity to come in and say these, this is how something should be handled. Um, so this is where people are living the conflict. This is where it's being enacted and decided. And there is also a cumulative, there is a cumulative effect. Communities talk to each other. Um, efforts in uh, Virginia to successfully change a school name uh, in Roanoke then affect the ability or uh, the affect the ability or the conversations that this activates then in false church. So it's not that these things happen in isolation, especially with social media and, and um, some of what we've seen as the effect of people talking to each other and activists referen referencing, referencing each other and talking to each other on many sides, but it's at the local is where people are living the conflict. Um, and this is where, uh, for me, Dennis Sandoli's voice comes in. I, I was very struck by students um, since the semester of how messy the conflict was. And partway through, feeling a sense of despair where before they had felt clarity, and I considered that a success, um, because they recognized that to actually do anything, to work with this, to have an eye for change or decision making, uh, or engagement around this um, was extraordinarily difficult, even to the effect of, do people want to talk about this? Will they consent to interviews? Um, and so I think the local piece is where people are living conflict. And it does have generalizability, and it does have echoes and relationships to other settings. And tracing those relationships is part of the project. Um, but for me, locating the local um, uh, helps bring it to life and is also the place where we can see both the complexity and the chaos of how um, this manifests in a particular place, because the solutions are going to be local in most of these cases. 
um, what matters, the creativity or lack thereof that is brought to bear, um, very much has dimensions um, that are grounded in locality um, and prior historical experiences, current experiences, demographics. Um, so there are real um, tangible lived realities that um, that affect this, even to the extent of how much of an activist community ha have they had, how much of recent tragedies or past strategi strategies left the community with a reservoir um, of people who know how to organize. So there's all these um, elements that make up um, complicated story that what's the story that this community is going to tell? Um, and I'm, I, I think that's why the local matters. And, and one last question from... So, Solon, this is a question about, well, I don't know if it's internal validity, external validity, really having you think about... So all of the paradigmatic thinkers have come out of a Western tradition, even Fanon, who by virtue of his... of the wounds of colonialism has, was deformed by, by, by a Western tr tradition. So I wonder if there and there's something neat about those matrices and six paradigmatic figures, but if you thought about, say, a paradigmatic Buddhist thinker, you know, there are other visions of the world, maybe. Now, I know that in your Nobel Prize uh, corpus, those data, you have people like Desmond Tutu, and you could see him speaking maybe about Ubuntu, but in a way that is assimilable. But it, just imagine for a moment, had, had, had Gandhi, Gandhi um, won a Nobel Prize, what would his speech have looked like? And what could be taken out of a Gandhian speech that maybe escapes some of the hermeticness, you know, the kind of elegant hermeticness of your analysis? That's a great question, Kevin. And it's at the core of what I'm doing, and, it, and it's, it's what I'm trying to do is I'm kind of trying to get my own house in order before I tackle that. And so what I, the next great project, I woke up one night in China, I was a vice president trying to promote programs overseas, and I said, what we need is a comparative conflict resolution. That is, we need, uh, we need Ibn Khaldun, we need Confucius. It was clearly in that context, it was at the Confucius Institute, so of course one's thinking about Confucius a lot. Um, but what I, what I would say is this, is that all of these emerging in a Western context don't limit their potential application. And I haven't found when I coded Gandhi's uh, speeches that I couldn't address um, what he's dealing with. Um, um, much of what you see, the, what's interesting about the Western, there's a way in which the Western conversation being not about what I would call values in a deeper spiritual sense, but being about power might be an interesting point of, 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 of opening for this conversation. That is, it's about power itself and how it's abused. And so, I think there's a richer tradition that one finds, especially in the Confucian uh, uh, tradition, that is not as explicitly and analytically focused on the kinds of power. But what you see in Confucian thinkers is something much similar. Uh, everyone knows what humiliation is and don't like it. And that's what's interesting why this is, uh, it's a value system that l survives after Nietzsche. That is, so when God is dead, what are you, where are your values? Well, they come out of human suffering. That's my point. And that human suffering is in fact not um, all that different of wherever you look, so that hum no one likes to be humiliated, no one likes to be exploited, no one likes to be coerced by uh, an illegitimate legal authority, and no one likes to be killed, you know, and that is by, by someone they consider to be an outsider and dominated in that way. And I find, so each one of those things, as, as I've tested myself, I don't think that it's a specifically Western point, and I, but I have not had the, the capacity, frankly, to think about this in the, with the sufficient breadth to, to do um, justice to those alternative traditions. But it doesn't mean that, that I think that's, that's the third book that I want to do after these two are done. So, so that, that's, that's where I want to go. <laughs> well, thank you all. We are now going to turn, thank you for everyone's presentation. Thank you for the discussion and for kicking off great um, questions. And thank you audience members. We're going to have lunch now and returning at 1230. Okay.